Please start. Good evening, everyone. I am V. Venkateshan, editor of the Leaflet. On behalf of the Leaflet, I am pleased to welcome you all to the third edition of the Leaflet special lecture series. We had the first webinar in this series on the Constitution Day last year, when Honorable Justice Gautam Patel, sitting judge of the Bombay High Court, gave us an illuminating address on the preservation of the idea of India. The address, I'm happy to say, has now come out in the form of a book by Justice Patel. We had a second webinar on April 2nd this year, when Honorable Justice A. S. Woka, a sitting judge of the Supreme Court of India, delivered a keynote speech on the vision of independent India, Ranade, Tilak, and Gokhale. The response to the speech was given by Mr. Aditya Sondi, a senior advocate, Karnataka High Court, and the discussion was moderated, uh, ably moderated by well-known journalist Apurva Vishwanath, assistant editor of the Indian Express. It would not be an exaggeration to say that Justice Oka's speech set the tone of contemporary public discourse on the relevance of sedition as an offense under the Indian Penal Code by drawing our attention to his historical context, especially to the times when Uh, Bal Gangadhar Tilak had revealed to us what it could mean to be at the receiving end of uh, misuse of a draconian law like sedition. In today's third edition of this special lecture series, Honorable Justice L. Nageshwar Rao, who retired from the Supreme Court recently, after, after an eventual six-year tenure, is going to enlighten us on life and liberty, India at 75 years of independence. The subject of today's discussion, like the themes of our two preceding webinars, is likely to provoke us to think and seek answers to the profound questions that have often bewildered us. All of us know that Article 21 of the Indian Constitution guarantees that no person shall be deprived of his or her life to personal liberty except according to procedure established by law. But the question whether Article 21 can be expanded to include various other human rights in its ambit has often engaged the interest of the students of the Indian Constitution. Although the Indian judiciary has leaned in favor of an expansive interpretation of this provision, academics and juries have often disagreed whether it was right to do so. Friends, I would not like to dwell more on this issue so as not to prejudge what our guest is likely to say on this subject. Instead, let me quickly disclose the rest of the today's program. Ms. Ritu Devan, our director and a well-known academic in her own right, will first introduce the leaflet, briefly outlining its genesis its current reach and the future. After this, senior advocate and one of the Leaflet's co-founder, Arun Anand Grover, will introduce today's guest, Justice L. Nageshwar Rao. Justice L. Nageshwar Rao will then deliver his speech, which will last up to 5.40 p.m., followed by a brief Q&A moderated by me and a member for our editorial board, Pamela Filippos. Over to Ms. Ritu Devan. Thank you very much. Welcome to our uh, very special Independence Day talk by a very honorable uh, Justice uh, Nageshwar Rao. The topic is, of course, life. life and liberty, as we know. And this really is we formed informally launched in March uh, 2018 and then formally launched again in April uh, 2019. And a byline, the strongest byline and the fundamentals of uh, our leaflet is what we say constitution first, that it holds priority over everything else. Now, the vision of uh, leaflet is embedded in our constitution, embedded in the activism, which is enshrined in our uh, constitution and which is an increasing jeopardy today. And therefore the urgent struggle, and this is what we try and do in leaflet, to protect and cover what is being eroded and has already been eroded and to strengthen every single right and value which is contained in the uh, constitution. For this, our purpose is to mobilize public opinion using what we used to call agitprop, the term which we have used for a very long time in uh, terms of activism and to defend the undefended. I think this is something which is very, very essential to the essence of uh, what the vision is. Our focus on the struggle for defending the undefended is based on the constitutional mechanisms and constitutional measures. And every single publication, talk, podcast of ours strongly fact-checked and uh, strongly presented, fully analyzed, and relating not only to law and legal rights, but to all rights 
which are enshrined and embedded in our constitution, whether it's the right to work, the right to health, to education, to livelihood, very much equality, equity, and of course, affirmative uh, action. We just hope that you will join us in this struggle of ours to defend the undefended. I now hand over to Arun Grover. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ritu and Venkateshan. It's my privilege on this auspicious day, the 75th anniversary of independence, to celebrate it. And on that occasion, by actually listening to the lecture that is going to be given by Justice L. Nageshwar Rao. In the context of what he himself said, introspection on vital issues of life and liberty under the constitution. That itself has traversed in different manners throughout these 75 years. It had its ups and downs. So we welcome Justice Rao to be able to deliver this lecture. Justice Rao was born on 8 June 1957 in Prakasam district in Andhra Pradesh. He did his BCom BL from Nakarunja University in Guntur, Andhra Pradesh. Justice Rao got himself enrolled as an advocate in 82 at the Bar Council of Andhra Pradesh and practiced in the district court of Guntur in Andhra from 80 to 84. From 85 to 94, Justice Rao practiced at the High Court of Andhra Pradesh in Hyderabad. He shifted to the Supreme Court in 1995. In 2000, he was designated as a senior advocate by his parent High Court. He served as an additional Solicitor General of India from August 2003 to May 2004, and again from 20th August 2013 to December 18, 2014. On 13 May 2016, he was appointed Judge of the Supreme Court. Justice Rao was the seventh judge in the Supreme Court who was appointed directly from the bench, or from the bar, I'm sorry. Before his appointment on the bench, Justice Rao had a lucrative practice in the Supreme Court. In fact, in 2014, the then Chief Justice of India, Justice Noda, had offered Justice Rao the judgeship, but he turned it down, citing various personal reasons and professional reasons. About two years down the line, he was again offered the judgeship by then the collegium led by Justice Thakur. This time he accepted the offer. During his six years tenure, Justice Rao has been able to deliver landmark judgments as a co-author or a person on the judge on the bench, as well as himself. He has authored nearly 222 judgments um, and in part of about 747 judgments. He also joined the Supreme Court Collegium by virtue of his seniority on August 11, 2021. Some of the judgments I just may mention, in 2017, Justice Rao was part of the seven judge constitution bench in Abhiram Singh versus C.D. Komachan, uh, which held by a majority of four to three that appealing to ascriptive identities of any candidate as well as voters constituted a corrupt practice under section 123 of the RPA Act. He was also part of the seven judge bench in Krishna Kumar Singh that held that pre-promulgation of ordinances is unconstitutional and a fraud on the constitution. In February 2020, Justice Rao was part of the nine judge a constitution bench that upheld the decision of Sabrimala Review Bench to, for, to refer it to a larger bench of the Supreme Court. Questions on ambient scope of religious freedom practiced by multiple faiths across the country. In May 2021, a five judge bench constitution, which is Justice Rao was a part, struck down the reservations of the Maratha community in educational institutions, etc. There have been some notable verdicts which I want to allude to. In March 2020, Justice Rao authored a landmark judgment that is the Indian Social Action Forum versus Union of India, holding that support to public causes by resorting to legitimate means of dissent, like buns and hartats, could not deprive an organization of its legitimate right of receiving foreign contributions under the FCRA. In a decision concerning unlawful activities, UAPA, a bench led by Justice Rao held that the payment of extortion money did not amount to terror funding under the UAPA. Another Justice Rao led bench quashed the criminal case against senior journalist Patricia Mukul, who was booked for her Facebook post condemning atrocities on non travels in Shillong. Earlier this year, a bench led by Justice Rao directed the Madhya Pradesh High Court to reinstate forthwith the female additional district judge who had resigned from service in 2014, alleging sexual harassment by a high court judge. Towards the end of his tenure, Justice Rao penned a significant ruling directing the release of Pira Villan, one of the convicts of the former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's assassination case, 
He was critical of the Tamil Nadu governor for not taking a decision on the petition filed by him, seeking remission on his sentence, despite the recommendation of the state cabinet. More importantly, Justice Rao presided over a bench which directed the release of the Samajwadi party leader Azam Khan on interim bail, observing that the interest of justice demanded his release, particularly when he had already been granted bail in 87 other criminal cases against him. Khan has been arrested in a case after case, even as he was granted bail in multiple cases against him. In Jacob Puliel's case, Justice Rao penned a very important judgment holding that bodily integrity is protected under Article 21 of the Constitution. Hence, no individuals can be forced to be vaccinated. He directed the restrictions imposed by some of the states and union territories on unvaccinated people cannot be said to be proportionate in view of the fact that the material brought to the notice of the court that the risk of transmission from unvaccinated people is almost on par uh, with the vaccinated people. In commutation of death penalty, he has had a leading part in almost all cases involving confirmation of death sentences, which came before the bench just led by Justice Law, of which he was either a part or an author, the bench commuted the sentence to life imprisonment. In 2019, in Nand Kishore versus State of Madhya Pradesh, a three-judge bench comprising Justice Bobde Rao and Shubhash Reddy commuted the death sentence into life imprisonment for a murder convict. Same thing happened in Raju Dagdish Paswan, where there was life imprisonment imposed on a person accused of brutal sexual assault on a nine-year-old girl. In Basvaraj, alias Basia, three-judge bench comprising Justice Kogai, Justice Rao, and Sanjeev Kanna again commuted the death sentence into life imprisonment for one of the convicts and acquitted the remaining three persons of several penal offenses. In Mofil Khan, Justice Rao led bench commuted the petitioner's death sentence after observing that the possibility of reformation and rehabilitation of the convict is an important factor which has to be taken into account as a mitigating circumstance before sentencing to death. And there are two cases which have been personally involved. One, of course, about uh, death penalty and commutation. In Locha Srivas versus the state of Chhattisgarh, Justice Rao's bench, the judgment was authored by Justice Gawai. They also commuted uh, death penalty to life imprisonment. I cannot tell you the impact of such cases. The release of that person actually on parole recently, uh, he conveyed his message that he was able to do that only because of the death penalty project of NLU and my role. But I conveyed back saying that it is because the judges who have not locked away their humanity in the intellectual cupboard. That is, those are my exact words. In the COVID crisis, Justice Rao actually led the bench and directed state governments to ensure dry rations to be provided to sex workers without insisting on any proof of identification. In the same case, he also issued a slew of directions, basically concerning the rehabilitation of sex workers on the basis of decency, dignity ex uh, extended to sex workers. For the first time under the orders of the Supreme Court, sex workers were held to be entitled to dignity and therefore the ration cards, Aadhaar cards, and uh, other cards, identity cards, election cards, etc. Again, the impact on the ground has been tremendous. Sex workers have told me that the, for the first time, they felt that they were counted as human beings in this country. Of course, that's a whole other story which we can hear about later on. Today, we are here to listen to him online on the vital issues of life and liberty and our constitution. Justice Rao, we look forward to your address. Thank you. Happy Independence Day to all of you. On this uh, momentous uh, milestone, I'm very pleased to be amongst you all. I take this opportunity to engage in some introspection into the idea of India and our identity as a democratic society after 75 years of our independence. As you would note, the evolution of our understanding of liberty is the chosen marker for today's discussion. In the words of Aristotle, the basis of a democratic state is liberty. But what does liberty mean? When we list liberty as the bedrock of a democratic nation, what is it 
that we seek to preserve or achieve. Surely, we cannot frame the sum and substance of liberty as a goal nor contextualize its significance in the exact notions as may have been done through time, say by the founding fathers of America or by the average Indian citizen under the British rule or by a person on the death row today. Possibly, the first instrument which bears a reference to liberty is the Magna Carta issued in 1215, which was intended to be a peace treaty to end a civil war between King John and the rebellious barons. Although rooted in war and thereafter repudiated and reissued several times, the Magna Carta has shaped the development of the law in England, the United States, and several parts of the globe. Also referred to as the Charter of Liberties, it promised to the entire political nation autonomous conduct, restraints on executive power, and the rule of law. The most widely commemorated provision of the Magna Carta is that no free man shall be seized or imprisoned, or stripped of his rights or possessions, or outlawed or exiled, or deprived of his standing in any way, nor will we proceed with force against him, or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his equals, or by the law of the land. Thus, the Magna Carta was instrumental in entrenching the due process of law, which was subsequently developed by means of judicial decisions and legislations. In the celebrated decision in Semen, rendered by the King's Bench, the right of a homeowner to defend their premises against intrusion of those seeking to enter under, under lawful authority was deliberated upon. Sir Edward Koch, while laying down that there were strict limits on how sheriffs may enter a person's house to issue writs, stated that the house of every one is to him as his castle and fortress, as well for defense against injury and violence as for his repose. Since quoted as a well-known maxim, a man's home is his castle that has influenced the discourse on liberty across jurisdictions, including India. As is known, the Constitution of England does not contain a code of fundamental rights. Through the concept of due process and the writ of habeas corpus, a balance has been struck between public security and individual liberty. However, as individual rights are sourced from ordinary legislations of the land, under the prevailing doctrine of parliamentary supremacy, the parliament may limit individual rights to give way to greater public good at any time, at least hypothetically. While it falls on the judiciary to safeguard individual rights, such powers of review exist against the executive only and do not extend to legislative acts. In contrast, the Constitution of the United States codifies guarantees to individual rights. While the original Constitution adopted in 1789 did not provide for a charter of individual rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution contain a list of rights which were guaranteed also against legislative measures. John Locke considered the guiding spirit for America's founding fathers, believed that while individuals were subject to natural law, they also had natural rights, that is, the right to life, liberty, and property. Unlike Hobbes' social contract, where men surrendered their freedom, freedom to the sovereign, according to Locke, men had merely entrusted power to a ruler in return for justice and mutual security on the condition that their natural rights are protected. As these rights were derived from something higher than the edicts of princes and were therefore inalienable. The framers of the American constitution who were apprehensive of not only the high handedness of the executive, but also of encroachment by the legislature, secured personal liberty through the 5th and 14th Amendments. A part of the 14th Amendment is that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. 
while attempting to balance public security and individual liberty, the due process clause serves to ensure that for the exercise of police power by a state to be considered lawful in maintenance of public peace and order, such exercise limiting individual rights cannot be arbitrary, unrestrained by the principles of distributive justice. The provision of fundamental rights in our constitution is drawn not from the principle of natural justice inherent in British common law, but on the American principles of constitutional guarantee. Part three of the constitution guarantees justiciable fundamental rights to citizens of India. And in some cases to all persons, whether citizens or foreigners, the enforcement of which can be sought before constitutional courts under writ jurisdiction. Article 14 extends to each person two aspects of equality. First, being equality before law, which is the negative content of the right wherein no one is above law and every person, whatever his rank or condition is, is subject to the ordinary jurisdiction of the courts. This aspect is antithetical to discrimination in any form. The second aspect, that is equal protection of laws, is viewed as the positive content of the right. This entails application of laws alike and without discrimination to all persons similarly situated and is the codification of the principle of substantive equality in the Constitution. Article 19 charts out the freedoms secured to citizens, which are not absolute in nature. In its present form, Article 19 guarantees the right to freedom of expression, assemble peaceably and without arms, form associations or unions or cooperative societies, move freely throughout the territory of India, reside and settle in any part of the territory of India and practice any profession or carry on any occupation, trade or business. However, the exercise of these freedoms is restricted by way of clauses 2 to 6 of Article 19, which impose limitations in the interests of sovereignty and integrity of India, public order, morality and other such enumerated competing factors. However, our constitution has gone a step further than the American constitution by defining the scope of the limitations on the civil liberties under Article 19. The restrictions imposed are to be reasonable. Of course, without a fixed standard of reasonableness provided in the constitution itself, it was left to the judiciary to grapple with setting out the contours of the standard that should be applied in assessing whether the impingement of liberty protected under Article 19 as a reasonable relation to the authorized purpose. Article 21 of the Constitution of India mandates that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty, except according to procedure established by law. As is common knowledge, the American Due Process Clause was the inspiration behind the Constituent Assembly's construction of Article 21. Dr. Ambedkar's draft constitution contained a Due Process Clause which was identical to the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. However, in a meeting between Justice Felix Frankfurter of the U.S. Supreme Court and Sir Benigal Narsingrao, constitutional advisor in the year 1947, the latter was advised to delete the phrase due process of law from the draft constitution. This was induced by the Lochner era of the U.S. Supreme Court, which prevailed at the time of drafting the Constitution of India. In Lochner versus New York, the US Supreme Court had invalidated a New York statute, which imposed a bar on employees in bakeries working for more than 60 hours per week or 10 hours a day, as the court was of the opinion that the restriction in the statute impeded with a person's liberty to contract. Due process of law was replaced yeah, you're not coming. by procedure established by law in our draft constitution. However, this was a highly contentious and intensely debated amendment. Several amendments were moved by the members of the Constituent Assembly to reintroduce the phrase due process of law. The apprehension in having the phrase deleted was put into words by Kazi Syed Karimuddin in that it did not permit the courts to look into 
the injustice of a law or into a capricious provision of law. He said, as soon as the procedure is complied with, there will be no end to everything and the judges will be only spectators. However, procedure established by law became permanently etched in our constitution with all amendments to alter it having failed. To compensate for the removal of due process, which could prove to be inimical to individual liberty, a new provision, draft Article 15A was inserted, which went on to become Article 22. This was intended to instill safeguards comparable to due process, such as those arrested and detained had a right to be informed of the ground of their arrest, to consult and be defended by a lawyer of their choice, and to be produced before a magistrate within 24 hours of the arrest. Dr. Ambedkar was of the belief that while clauses 1 and 2 of Article 22 were already founded in CRPC, by incorporating them into the constitution and shielding them from abrogation by the parliament and the state legislatures, a fundamental change has been brought about to protect against illegal and arbitrary arrests. However, Article 22 further goes on to create an exception to the ordinary rules of criminal due process and permits preventive detention up to three months, that is, without trial, and also permits the parliament to decide the maximum time for which a person can thus be detained. This draft article was also a provision of fierce debate amongst the members of the Constituent Assembly. Many expressed concerns around the period of three months being too excessive and fell back on their own experiences of incarceration under the British rule to highlight the issues of a legal order permitting deprivation of liberty without fair process. Mahavir Tyagi was most adamant in his expression of concerns about the subject when he said that this is a charter of freedom that we are considering. But is this a proper place for providing for the curtailment of that very freedom and liberty? When freedom is being guaranteed, why does the drafting committee think it fit to introduce provisions for detaining people and curtailing the freedom? This is an article which will enable the future government to detain people and deprive them of the liberty rather than guarantee it. Dr. Ambedkar defended the inclusion of preventive detention by considering it necessary in the present circumstances of the country. In such cases, he did not think that the exigency of the liberty of individual should be placed above the interests of the state. Scholars have pointed out that the circumstances referred to by Ambedkar were those of partition. In the context of enormous bloodshed, the extensive displacement that people were facing, and the imminence of communal violence breaking out, these provisions were considered necessary to protect public order. Unsurprisingly, the first landmark decision where the Supreme Court of India was called upon to interpret the meaning of life and liberty under Article 21, dealt with the constitutional validity of the Preventive Detention Act 1950. In A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras, the petitioner argued that the Preventive Detention Act 1950 not only contravened Article 21, but also was violative of Article 13 and 19. Further, it was contended that under Article 21, procedural due process of law was guaranteed to every person in India and procedure established by law should be construed as due process of law to give true meaning to the provision. The plural opinion of the Supreme Court was that Article 19 and 21 occupy exclusive domains and reading freedoms as overlapping between Article 19 and 21 would require the alleged infringement to be tested against Article 19 as well, which imposed additional restrictions on the state. Only Justice Fazal Ali was of the view that Part 3 did not contemplate that each article is a code by itself and is independent of the others. According to him, preventive detention, which was dealt with in Article 22, amounted to deprivation of personal liberty referred in Article 21 and was a violation of the right of freedom of movement 
dealt with in Article 191D. Again, the contention of the petitioner that the words procedure established by law denoted that due process of law was not accepted by the majority who were heavily influenced by the constituent assembly debates and the deliberate act of the framers of our constitution in avoiding due process of law. Therefore, once a procedure was established by law, meaning once a law was validly enacted by the legislature, Article 21 could not have been infringed. This interpretation of Article 21 gave way in the landmark judgment of Manaka Gandhi versus Union of India. The petitioner's passport had been impounded under the provisions of the Passports Act 1967, and the government has decided in the interest of general public not to furnish a copy of the statement or reasons for having passed such order. The petitioner contended that the relevant provisions of the Passports Act was violative of Article 14, Article 21, as the prescribed procedure under it was wholly arbitrary and unreasonable. The Supreme Court, in deciding this case, made it explicit that there existed freedoms which were covered by both Article 19 and 21. And for such freedoms, the state would have to satisfy the requirement of both provisions along with meeting the non arbitrariness standards sourced in Article, 20, Article 14. The thrust of this case, however, was on the interpretation of the words procedure established by law, wherein a majority of the judges came to the conclusion that a procedural law which deprived personal liberty had to be fair, just, and reasonable, not fanciful, oppressive, or arbitrary. Thereby, reading the right to be heard before having one's passport impounded under the Passports Act. This pronouncement turned Gopalan's findings on absence of procedural due process in our constitution entirely on its head and cemented a marked revolution in the due process jurisprudence under Indian constitutional law. Even before Menaka Gandhi, attempts have been made to explore rights that could be covered within the meaning of personal liberty. Article 21 evolved over the decades to encompass the right to live with dignity, the right to privacy, the right to fair trial, access to justice, the right to adequate nutrition, clothing, shelter and facilities, and several other socio-economic rights. However, I will be limited, limiting this talk to the relevance of physical liberty and the protections afforded to it as they stand today. Bail is the rule, jail is the exception. Despite this phrase having been repeated by courts ad nauseum, it is an undeniable reality that jails in India are overflowing with under trial prisoners. In a recent judgment of the Supreme Court in Satendra Kumar Antil versus CBI, issuing directions to investigation agencies as well as courts for non-compliance of section 41 and 41A of CRPC, directions given in earlier and directions given in earlier judgments. The court notes that majority of the under trials are not even required to be arrested despite registration of a cognizable offense being punishable for seven years or less, which unfortunately puts on exhibit the mindset of investigative agencies, a vestige of colonial India, notwithstanding the fact that arrest is a draconian measure resulting in curtailment of liberty and is thus to be used sparingly. The state's proclivity to act first and make out a case subsequently has increasingly resulted in filing of FIRs and initiation of criminal process without investigating agencies applying their minds at times to even assess whether the alleged act meets the minimum ingredients of an offense under the IPC or other substantive penal laws. Another prominent strategy employed is to selectively prosecute opponents and dissenters in a bid to muzzle or discredit critical or contrary voices. A database launched by Article 14, a research and reportage initiative, followed 13,000 cases of sedition between 2010 to 2021 and indicated 
that out of 126 people for whom trails had been concluded in this period, 13 were convicted of charges of sedition, which accounts to 0.1% of those who face such charges. It is not uncommon to see the invocation of harsh legislations, including anti-terror laws, towards instances which are not strictly within the confines of the offenses they seek to penalize. The criminal justice system today can be perceived as one prioritizing expansion of state power in the name of public order by limiting individual liberty. A trigger-happy approach towards initiating criminal prosecution can amount to the criminal process itself constituting punishment or retribution, a tactic to threaten or censor those who the state might perceive as presenting a challenge to its authority or legitimacy. In the face of the apparent bleakness of the situation, it must be remembered that the Supreme Court has been known to intervene through the decades to preserve the core constitutional ideas and act as the bulwark of liberty against attempted encroachments. Looking as far back as the Preventive Detention Act 1950, the Supreme Court had, through a spate of judgments, given extensive relief to detainees by applying procedural safeguards provided in Article 22. In Puranla Lakhanpal versus Union of India, the court tasked with interpreting Article 22.5 of the Indian Constitution concluded that an opinion of the advisory board indicating that there was sufficient cause for detention would be required to per se continue with the detention of an individual under preventive detention laws and not only to extend the period of detention beyond the prescribed period of three months. The courts have questioned detentions where the advisory board submitted its report too late or the detaining authority acted malafide and set aside detention orders if the grounds were found to be vague or irrelevant. With time, the courts use dignity to broaden the scope of the right to life, especially in cases pertaining to prisoners and their treatment while incarcerated. It is acknowledged by the Supreme Court may have dealt a grave blow to its legitimacy when it failed to prevent arbitrary arrests and detentions during the emergency in the mid-1970s in the ADM Jabalpur case. However, the court has always come back more conscious and with renewed affirmation to its constitutional duty, as can be seen from judgments dotting its relatively short yet noteworthy history. In, his, in Sunil Batra versus uh, Delhi administration, the Supreme Court, while addressing questions on constitutionality of solitary confinement and bar fetters, ruled that fundamental rights do not flee the person as he enters the prison, although they may suffer shrinkage necessitated by incarceration. Where the rights of a prisoner, either under the Constitution or under other law, are violated, the writ power of the court can and should run to his rescue. There is a warrant for this vigil. Continuing to be the torchbearer of dignity, the Supreme Court went on to decry the practice of handcuffing in the case of Prem Shankar Shukla versus Delhi administration as prima facie inhuman and therefore unreasonable over harsh and at first blush arbitrary. It further declared that absent fair procedure and objective monitoring to inflective ions is to resort a zoological strategies repugnant to Article 21. While engaging with the rights of detainees, the court has made significant pronouncements on custodial torture and death, sexual violence in custody, and issued wide-ranging directions on procedure for arrest, treatment of inmates, living conditions, and access to legal aid. The court has not limited itself to elaborating on rights of those whose liberty has already been checked. The Supreme Court has been persistent and intrepid in confronting the misuse of criminal process by the state and has denounced such practices in a, in a number of judgments. Elaborating on the role of courts in protecting human liberty, the Supreme Court in Arnab Manoranjan Goswami versus State of Maharashtra 
was unambiguous in urging courts to be alive to the misuse of criminal law. The court held that it is the duty of courts across the spectrum to ensure that the criminal law does not become a weapon for selective harassment of citizens. Courts should be alive to both ends of the spectrum, the need to ensure the proper enforcement of criminal law and the need on the other of ensuring that the law does not become a ruse for targeted harassment. Liberty across human errors is as tenuous as tenuous can be. In the recent judgment of the Supreme Court granting interim bail to the journalist Mohammed Zubair in FIRs registered for a series of tweets made by him on the social media platform, having found that the petitioner had been subjected to a sustained investigation by the Delhi police, the court saw no reason or justification for the deprivation of the liberty of the petitioner to persist any further. The court sought to paint a very significant demarcation of the existence of the power of arrest from the exercise of the power. Recognizing that the petitioner was trapped in a vicious cycle of the criminal process, where the process itself had become punishment, the court reiterated the guidelines laid down in Arnesh Kumar versus State of Bihar with respect to power of police to arrest individuals, emphasizing that such power was not unbridled. It is also of note to consider the role of the courts in seeking to develop the liberty jurisprudence within the parameters of special acts, such as the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 1967. The 2008 amendment to the UAPA required the court to deny bail if there were reasonable grounds to believe that the case against the accused was prima facie true. This made it difficult to secure the grant of bail as the court was required to form its opinion only from the chart sheet prepared by the National Investigation Agency, beyond which the court cannot can provide no evidence. Despite the provision, the Supreme Court has granted bail to the accused who have undergone long periods of incarceration, seeking to balance the alleged offense against how long the accused has suffered and how likely a swift trial was. In K. Najib versus Union of India, the court was of the view that statutory restrictions such as section 43 capital D within brackets 5 of the UAPA did not oust the inability of constitutional courts to grant bail on grounds of violation of part 3 with the rigors of such provisions melting down when there is there was no likelihood of trial being completed within a reasonable period and the period of incarceration had exceeded a substantial part of the prescribed sentence. Keeping these parameters in mind, the court has continued to enlarge individuals charged under the UAPA, with Varavara Rao in the Bhima Koregaon case being the latest beneficiary, Varavara. where the court also took into consideration his medical condition. Varavara. These judgments are by no means lone instances of the court acts acting as the guardian of the inestimable right of liberty. Rather, they are beacons of hope as to the way forward. The framers of our constitution had believed in the constitution to remain relevant and influential as long as the three arms of the state continued their allegiance to the roles carved out for them under the constitution. With any one arm exceeding the boundaries of the constitutional exercise of its power, the fragile equilibrium goes askew. Irrespective of who such imbalance may seek to favor in the immediate future, if we turned away from the gradual erosion of constitutionally protected values, it is we the people of India who stand to lose our somewhat imperfect yet precious democracy, a heavy cost that will be borne by all and sundry. Another significant suggestion that had come forth from Justice Frankfurter to Sri B. N. Rao at the time of preparation of our draft constitution was to have the Supreme Court of India sit and bank, that is, together. However, due to practical considerations such as the number of judges in our court and the volume of cases that are before the court, we have not taken the same approach as that of the U.S. Supreme Court. The task of a judge is not easy. It is indeed difficult to interpret and apply the law 
without viewing values and principles through the lens of one's personal belief systems at times. Benjamin Cardozo, a celebrated American jurist and judge of the US Supreme Court, deliberates on the forces which judges avowedly avail to shape the form and content of their judgments in his book, The Nature of the Judicial Process. He says, even those forces are seldom fully in consciousness. They lie so near the surface, however, that their existence and influence are not likely to be disclaimed. Deep below consciousness are other forces, the likes and the dislikes, the predilections and the prejudices, the complex of instincts and emotions and habits and convictions, which make the man, whether he be litigant or judge. It is natural, therefore, for there to be some variance at times in the application of law by the court. However, such departures cannot and should not create a dent in the vast and rich jurisprudence developed systematically and painstakingly by the Supreme Court, speaking through scores of judges to act as a true combatant against the infraction of fundamental rights on behalf of all those who lay claim. Late last year, the Supreme Court has issued notice to the central government in a writ petition challenging the constitutional validity of UAPA. Earlier this year, while considering petitions challenging Section 124A of the Indian Penal Code, the Supreme Court, after noting the stand of the government, that the colonial provision required consideration as it was out of tune with the current social milieu, ordered for the provision to be kept in abeyance till the union government reconsidered the provision. It also held that those who were already booked under Section 124A and under incarceration could approach the concerned courts for bail. It is the very same court which has in the recent years adopted the concept of transformative constitutionalism to reimagine and reinterpret constitutional provisions, which though drafted over 70 years back, comprise an instrument enabling the India of today and of the years to come to secure and give full expression to the ideals of liberty equality and fraternity. The court as the custodian and interpreter of the constitution has taken note of the purpose of having a constitution, which is to transform a constantly changing factual and social reality for the better. It, was, it is to this bounden duty that the courts must continue to swear a fealty. I express my gratitude to Leaflet and uh, Anand Grover and the other members of uh, Leaflet for giving me this opportunity to share my views on uh, life and liberty after 75 years of the Constitution. Thank you very much. Can't hear. Mr. Venkateshan, it seems you are muted. I'm now you take over because. Okay. okay. We hear you, but we can't hear uh, Venkatesh. Venkatesh, can, can you unmute yourself, please? Uh, I'm now you can start. Yes. In, in the mute. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice. And it was wonderful hearing you as a beacon of liberty. And uh, we look forward to more of these interactions with you. Uh, your talk actually raised a lot of questions. And, uh, you know, it is quite interesting that most of the questions actually have 
the PMLA judgment as a source of it. Clearly, it is a cause for great concern. And uh, so let me just read out a couple of questions that have come in. I mean, we have about seven questions, but at the moment, let me read out the first three. The first is from Ari Budin Ahmed, and he asks, do you think that the recent judgment by the Supreme Court while upholding the powers of the ED is quite problematic in terms of excessive power or curtailing of personal liberty? Uh, another question comes from Prashant Padmanavan who asks, your response to the criticism from several jurists, including many retired justices, about the recent SC judgment on PMLA. And our third question, and I'll end here and before taking the next lot, uh, that is from Arun Kumar. Please illuminate us with the changes brought in the concept of Welcome liberty under the recent PMLA judgment by the Honorable Supreme Court. So justice, the floor is yours. Question and answer, answer session. The first thing that came to my mind is that definitely there are going to be some questions on this judgment. Uh, at the outset, I should tell you that I'm not uh, going to be critical of uh, either the judges who have written the uh, judgment or uh, the philosophy of the judgment. Left to me, I should be very frank uh, that I might have taken a different view. I have read uh, uh, the very judgment uh, and I've read also the criticism by uh, several uh, legal scholars and uh, retired judges about uh, the viewpoint of the Supreme Court uh, in the said judgment. There was an earlier judgment of uh, Nikesh Shah which was uh, ordered by Justice uh, Nariman where uh, he declared section 45 of uh, the PMLA as uh, arbitrary being violative of Article 14, as well as uh, uh, violative of Article 21 of the Constitution of India. He also uh, uh, referred to uh, the discriminatory aspect of uh, the punishments involved in various offenses. After the amendment, uh, the same provision has been brought back uh, by making certain changes, uh, which were pointed out by Justice uh, Narima. So there were several points that were argued uh, for uh, a number of days uh, by a number of lawyers uh, on various aspects, mainly pertaining to the liberty of uh, individuals who are charged for offenses under the PMLA. The aspects pertaining to liberty are uh, mainly in uh, the ECIR, which is uh, equivalent to the FIR, uh, not being given uh, to the accused because when persons are uh, called to question by the ED, they really don't know whether they are accused or whether witnesses and what is it that uh, is, is sought from them. So the judgment uh, is to the effect that uh, grounds of arrest after a person is uh, inquired into by the authorities are given to a, that uh, person might not be uh, sufficient because uh, the fundamental uh, criminal uh, jurisprudence uh, is to the effect that a person who's uh, charged of a criminal uh, offense has to be told about the charge. He should be informed about what he is charged with. So if the ECIR need not be given, uh, it is very difficult for a person to defend himself even when he files an application for bail. And uh, the other aspect pertains to bail where uh, the burden shifts, but there are certain statutes where burden shifts. And there are findings pertaining to ED officers not being uh, police officers. So there is uh, a general feeling that uh, there is a setback to personal liberty because of what has been uh, stated in this judgment. But uh, this is not an end all. There are... Uh, Several uh, judgments that were written by the uh, Supreme Court, some of them taking a different view might be, but uh, you will come across uh, a number of judgments where uh, the court has been uh, saying that 
liberty is to be uh, protected. In December 2021, uh, there was a case that came up before uh, the present Chief Justice of India, where uh, he uh, made a comment uh, that uh, uh, people are unnecessarily uh, being dragged into uh, cases under PMLA by the ED. And then he again mentioned uh, that uh, the process itself is becoming a punishment. So while registering cases under the PMLA, he sounded uh, a note of caution uh, that authorities uh, have to be very careful because of the consequences uh, about a case being registered and a person uh, not being able to get uh, bail uh, very easily. So this being the issue, I don't want to go further into whether it is wrong, right? Because I said that personally, I might have taken a different uh, opinion. If I was writing a judgment, I'll uh, stop at that. And uh, the last question which you mentioned about uh, somebody asking whether the concept of liberty has undergone a change with this judgment, I am afraid not concept of liberty which has been uh, evolving over the past uh, 75 years um, is uh, clearly to the effect that courts are in favor of protecting the personal liberty of an individual. Uh, the, I read in the morning an interview given by the Chief Justice designate Justice Yu Lalit, where he said that 90% uh, of uh, uh, the persons who are in prisons are under trial prisoners. And um, he has also referred to a judgment of the Supreme Court earlier in uh, Sanjay Chandra and then said for uh, offenses uh, where the maximum punishment is uh, seven years sentence, there is no need for keeping a person in uh, jail for a period of more than six months, subject to, of course, uh, the various uh, conditions for a grant of bail, uh, which would be that uh, there is a likelihood of a person fleeing from justice or tampering with the evidence or repeating an offense. So these are considerations which any of, uh, need to be taken into account. The Supreme Court is alive to the problem. And the recent judgment in Satyendra Jain, the Supreme Court has even uh, recommended to, to the parliament to enact a bail act because uh, uh, the court said uh, the Mofasils uh, find uh, it very difficult uh, to grant bails. And then we see that uh, uh, people have been incarcerated for a long number of years, even as under trial prisoners. Trials take their own uh, uh, time. And uh, I have seen in my tenure of six years, large number of cases where persons uh, come to us, uh, even in offenses where the sentence is less than seven years, after four or five years that uh, charges are not framed, trial is going to take a long time, but still they are in jail. So I, I'm of the opinion that the concept of liberty has definitely not changed and the court definitely is there to protect liberty. Thank you very much. Um, let me go to the next question. What is your view about the theory adopted by the Supreme Court recently? That it is, uh, that it is, uh, it cannot turn the clock back. That is from Belu Sri Krishna. Then there's another one from Sarfaraz Bhagwan who asks, Honorable Justice, what are checks and balances to overcome selective prosecution today? And uh, in this batch, finally, there's an anonymous attendee who asks, when bail is a norm and jail is the exception, how can institutional reform be done at the lower courts in the extent of jail uh, rejection that takes place? So answering the last question first about uh, bail uh, uh, being the norm and jail is the exception. Uh, I have been repeatedly saying uh, uh, in court as well as in my judgments that uh, there's no ambiguity in law. It's only in the implementation of uh, the law laid down by the Supreme Court, the difficulty arises. It's not as if people don't understand what the law is. Uh, to my uh, individual perception, 
the trial court judges are uh, working under tremendous no, no, pressure uh, is not a... there are uh, uh, cases uh, where a grave offense has been uh, committed uh, by uh, somebody uh, who is big or is a politician or there is a sensational case the press takes over and there is some sort of a public opinion that is built up even before the uh, district judge or even uh, the magistrate takes up the case and uh, the judge is not really uh, sure as to how we should proceed he is also a human being so there is already a trial that is going on uh, in the public he doesn't know whether if he grants a bill what's going to be done if he doesn't grant a bill uh, there's a problem so this is something which i have seen personally it's not as if i'm making a comment that all judges are like that but there is a uh, this uh, lurking uh, fear um, in the minds of the judges when they deal with applications uh, of bail especially in sensational cases as i've already said uh, the, repeatedly the supreme court has been saying for the past 40 years uh, there is no point in keeping under trials in prison uh, unless there is a grave danger there is a grave danger to the society or they're going to be a menace to the society and uh, if you see the statistics uh, as i've just mentioned if 90% of the prisoners in jail are under trial uh, under trial prisoners uh, it, it speaks uh, it doesn't speak well about uh, our judiciary in handling matters of uh, liberty and article 21 there is a need for a change in mindset that uh, there's no point in keeping uh, all and sundry in jail what is it uh, that uh, is achieved by doing that and i don't think uh, the judgments uh, which have been delivered recently which are the which are in the minds of people who are asking these questions whether they have turned the clock back and then whether there's some uh, problem with the uh, jurisprudence of uh, uh, criminal law or bails there might be a case where uh, a different opinion has been uh, taken in interpretation of a particular law but there are several other judgments on uh, draconian laws uh, like uapa or whatever where uh, the courts uh, in my speech have mentioned uapa also contains the same provisions where getting a bail is very difficult but uh, the supreme court has granted bails by taking into account the fact that persons have been in jail for a long number of years and also taking into account the fact that it's going to take a long time for completion of trial speaking for myself while i was deciding uh, bail applications of uh, convicts also pending appeals uh, we used to release people on bail after a substantial sentence at least 50% which is a norm that is followed in the supreme court uh by suspending their sentence there are uh, some high courts in this country where uh, the criminal appeals uh, take uh, 15 to 20 years so you don't uh, want prisoners to complete their uh, a term of imprisonment during the pendency of appeal uh taking into account the facts of each case and then we take a call but we definitely at least i definitely was in favor of passing orders of suspension of sentences if people have undergone substantial sentences that is at least 50% as i have said and most of uh, the courts though we function in divisions uh, there is some sort of a uniformity there in grant of bails people take the same view and liberty definitely is something which uh, is at the heart of almost all the judges in the supreme court yes thank you so much uh, there are two more questions and with that we'll end the session uh, and thank you for the spirit with which you are answering these questions there is one question from kostob raguvanshi who asks kapil sibal recently said that he had no hope left in the supreme court what is your response and there's a question from jennifer fernandez would you agree sir that there is a tendency to vigorously prosecute members of the minority community more presumably than others thank you i'll end here i know there are more questions but i think our time has come to an end yeah yeah we'll have to end here now sir uh, uh... sibal has argued uh, all those cases uh, which you were uh, 
which the viewers were asking about and uh, which I was uh, talking about. And uh, Sibyl has his own uh, uh, personal uh, views about uh, the uh, Supreme Court and uh, his losing hopes, with which I don't agree. Uh, judiciary uh, is an institution uh, on which uh, the members of the public and uh, the citizenry has some hopes. In this uh, checks and balances, there was a question which was put earlier also, which is uh, really very important for the smooth functioning of uh, democracy. Uh, judiciary is a very important institution uh, to check any arbitrary actions of the executive. If the public lose confidence in this institution, then uh, there will be uh, absolutely no check on any excesses committed by the executive. Merely because of uh, a few uh, judgments which are not to the liking of uh, uh, certain persons, which they perceive that uh, this might be uh, not in consonance with the uh, article. Hope in an institution which has been for the past 75 years uh, protecting the uh, rights of uh, individuals. Just see the expanse of Article 21. So many unenumerated rights uh, read into Article 21 taking up the cause of the underprivileged and taking up the cause of those disadvantaged sections of the society was only because of the interference of the court that uh, people have got food, shelter, education, and uh, their uh, sufferings have been taken note of by the court. And uh, the court has encouraged the uh, states as well as the union to do what they did. Mr. Grover was mentioning about uh, the orders passed by the court uh, of which I was a member. I should tell you that uh, it's not only the sex workers, it's uh, those uh, children who become orphans uh, during uh, COVID. When I was uh, handling all these cases, I found uh, that the state governments and the central government were very cooperative in reaching out to all these persons who were actually ignored by the society. All this is only because of uh, the court. So there is no point in losing hope on the court. We just have to put behind uh, any uh, judgment or any feeling of disappointment and then hope that the Supreme Court continues to do the good work it has been doing for the past 75 years. Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Justice Rao. Uh, Mr. Venkateshan was supposed to do the vote of thanks, but there's a technical hitch and he can't. So I, I'll just take that uh, liberty to do it. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Justice Rao for not only an excellent uh, speech that he delivered, but also for the first time, we actually had in the program questions uh, to be answered by the learned judge. And I must say that Justice Rao, uh, fielded the questions very ably. And uh, in fact, uh, I hope that he's instilled hope in young lawyers as also older ones who seem to have lost hope. And I agree with him that not only should we not, never lose hope, but work towards trying to change the institution by intervening constructively. I want to thank the, uh, the members of the leaflet team, Mr. Venkatesh, Pamela, Ritu, Shiva, who's behind the scenes, and all the others who have done the work to make this uh, uh, happen. Thank you very much. Uh, and lastly, but not least, thank you for the audience. Uh, they've been uh, there all along, but it's also being relayed on YouTube and the text of the speech will be available as soon as possible. I must say that the leaflet cooperates with Live Law and other uh, institutions. In fact, Live Law is tweeting it and we have no copyright over the speech. So whoever can actually make the speech widely available, we give it to them. Of course, we publish it first, but we don't uh, retain copyright over it because we have not had any consideration, but more so because I think the ideas which Justice Rao has actually uh, posited need to be uh, disseminated much more. So thank you again, Justice Rao. It is really good that you could spare your valuable time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank everybody. you. Thank you.